things. So I made a commitment for this presentation. There's not a single slide. So as you can see by the very professional um, presentation, Wireshark is fun. And I think it is. Uh, I live and die by the peak app. It's my favorite thing ever. Um, I'm actually going to move this mic to the other side, if that's cool. Now that y'all adjusted the cameras, you're like, dang it, Sean. There we go. OK, cool. So one thing that I always, I always thought with Wireshark, and, I, and I've lived by it, is the, the devil's in the details, the devil's in the packets. Um, I'd, I'd have application guys. I come from a background of uh, network troubleshooting. I was on a LANWAN analyst team for 10 years. Um, and I'd always have the application guys hey, tell me, hey, it's the network. It's always the network. Our logs say we're having network problems. And I'd be like, OK, well, cool. Let's get a packet capture. And I'd get me a packet capture, and I'd show that it's not the network. And they'd go, well, I still think it's the network. OK, that's fine, right? And I'd always like, break out the OSI model. And, and I've said OSI model, and I've seen a few of you groan already. But yes, I live and die by the OSI model, and it's great. Um, so we're going to dive right into Wireshark. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do any other presentation starts, but I want to see, if, has anyone ever done this? You open up a key PCAP, or has anyone seen someone do this, and they just start doing this, this action? You ever see this? And then they scroll down, and they're looking, and they're looking, and like, oh, found the problem. It's red. There's red in that PCAP. And then they go to their network guys, and they say, hey, just so you know, you've got TCP dupe acts on your network. And the guys go, OK, that's great. And pretty much all of your credentials and all of your uh, goodwill that you've fostered over the years is now gone. So at a raise hand, who's actually opened and installed Wireshark before? Who would consider themselves somewhat comfortable in Wireshark? A few? Cool. That's good enough. Um, I want this presentation to be kind of like the cafeteria style. Take what you like, leave what you don't. Some of the stuff is my own personal preferences and how I do things. If you like it, great. If you don't, that's cool too. The very first thing I'm going to say is ditch the default layout because it's terrible. And if you use it, you should feel bad. Because it was designed back when we had 4.3 monitors. So I'm just going to switch the profile to my own. Fun fact, you can actually have multiple configuration profiles in Wireshark. So based on what you're doing, if you're trying to troubleshoot a certain thing, you can actually build an entire layout, different columns, different coloring rules based on different functions you're doing. So if you're like doing slowness or, or resets or you're trying to do something completely different, you can have different configuration profiles. So you're not always going through and changing it, which I found is great. So I'm going to switch it over to mine. And if someone wants this, I'll be happy to give it to them. Again, this is just my personal layout, what I like to do. As you can see, I've changed the, your packet list, packet details, packet bytes right there. Um, You'll see my coloring rules are a little bit different, and I've got different columns than most folks have. I like it this way because I can use my widescreen uh, monitors and kind of break this up a little bit. You'll notice that I've got different columns. First one is length, and that's very important. I'll show you why in a bit. I've got delta time displayed, and as you may or may not know, that is the time difference between this packet and this packet it is calculated that delta. I've got an absolute time, and I use that just for the old, like when someone says, you know, the issue happened at 3 o'clock. So I can go in there and go, go look at 3 o'clock. Uh, most people don't know this, but by default, this time, um, the default in Wireshark, the time, if you don't go and change that to a, a UTC time or something generic, it'll actually change the time zone from where they captured it to your own, thinking it's being helpful. I spent hours upon hours analyzing a trace when they said the problem happened at 4 PM, and it was on the East Coast, and I was in Utah. And I was looking at 2, and I'm like, I'm not seeing anything. Well, turns out Wireshark was doing that for me. Um, so yeah, the first thing you do, change the layout, um, all that stuff. Um, I, I, I kind of want to talk about filtering. Filtering is the real power that comes with Wireshark. And, and I worry that people get um, intimidated by it. Like They're like, I don't know the syntax, and I don't to do, know how to do it. They've actually built a pretty robust click, point and click, like GUI-driven filtering that, that you can take advantage of. So literally, I'm just going to start scrolling this random trace, and I'm going to go to that git, right? Um, who's familiar with the, the TCP three-way handshake? You know that, SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK? We've seen that before. What if you want to see all the SINs in the packet capture? Well, the cheaters are just going to go like this. TCP.flags.sin equals equals one, right? We have that memorized, some of us. Some of us don't. Well, those same, they're, that same information is in every packet. If you just drop down to um, your TCP header here, go down to your SIN bit, you can right-click on that, prepare a filter, and do selected. T speed flags at sin equals zero, chain it to a one. You just built, there's all your sins in your whole trace, right? Cool GUI driven way to do it, um, super handy. Let's say, for example, um, we want to see all of the 
times that a box reached out to a certain, or any box reached out to a certain host. I'm gonna switch captures here. Um, I'm actually using the CTF PCAP from SyncCon this year. Thanks to them for letting me use this. Um, it was super helpful. If you didn't get a chance to do that at SyncCon, try next time. Really great, a lot of fun. Um, let's just say I want to find out every time someone reached out to a bad host. So I'm just gonna do HTTP for my filter there. Just show me the HTTP for now. And again, we're gonna drill down, just like we did before. Um, for those that aren't comfortable with the OSI model, I can make it even simple. Layer two, layer three, layer four, application layer. That's the simplest way to remember it. But we're gonna drop down to this HTTP, and there's the host, that's the host. We're gonna right click on that, prepare a filter, selected, HTTP.host, right there. That's how you can build, that, build those filters if you don't want to remember the syntax, you don't wanna learn the syntax, you're still getting used to it, and you'll eventually get there and you'll start remembering, and that's great. But there's ni it's nice to have some GUI-driven things to kind of help you there in the beginning. Um, one thing you can also do that a lot of folks don't hang out with, let's say you've got a ton of data and you don't want to filter it that way, and you just want to have a header, or a, excuse me, a column, and you want to see that, you can actually right-click on any of these things down here and then do a apply as column. And then you're going to get grumpy because Wireshark does not like adding columns while you do it, and you're going to have to click and drag and move around, and then suddenly it'll show up on that right side. And there it is. So if you're looking at this trace kind of like holistically and you do want to scroll through and say, who's everyone that talked out to this uh, particular host? Super cool. Now, let's say you don't want to scroll. Let's say I've got this, let's say you took the trace from a, a mirrored port um, on the egress of your network, which is fine. You take that on a mirrored port and you've got tons of hosts and you're like, I want to know every single host that reached out to this particular bad actor, this accounting.acmephysics.com that is throwing credentials out in the clear, but we're not going to worry about that for now. Um, so what you can actually do is go out here to your um, statistics, hit your conversations, limit that to your display filter because we are filtering on that bad host. And from there, there's only one host that talked to it, but that would actually dump an entire list of every host that reached out and talked to it. So if you wanted a quick who got popped, run that, it'd be super easy. Um, Another thing that comes through a lot is I mentioned tracing and, and doing a mirrored port trace. A lot of times when as a, um, as, a, as a packet analyzer, you'll say, hey, I want you to get me a packet capture and I want you to take it from a mirrored port. I don't want it on the machine, I want it from a mirrored port. And they're like, okay, sure. And they think they're gonna pull a sneaky on you and they'll just capture it on the machine. And the first thing I do, every trace I get, I kind of try to figure out where did this trace come from? Now. One super cool thing about Ethernet is for a packet to live on the wire, it's gotta be at least a length of 60. Now it's 60 plus four bytes for uh, error or um, track summing, but Wireshark, strip, Wireshark strips those off for us, so there's 60. So if I ever get a trace that is the minimum length 60, and you can actually sort by that, I'll know that this trace was likely captured external to a machine. But if I get a trace that looks a little bit different, I'll show you that, uh, let's do our TTL example. go up here, I've got packets that are less than 60. And I can click on one of those, or I can click on, a, there's actually a lot of them on this one. Let's just grab one of these. I now know that the source where this was captured was this Microsoft device right here with this MAC address because my packet length is 54, and then that's my source uh, MAC address right there. So when everyone says, hey, yep, I absolutely mirrored a port, and I see packets that are less than 60, I go, no, you didn't. Why don't you go get me another trace? And they'll double down. They'll say, no, I mirrored a port. And I'm like, okay, you really didn't. Why don't you give me another trace? And then magically, we got someone else involved and then the trace I want actually shows up, which is super, super handy to have. So just these small little tips and tricks that I'm showing you are kind of things that you just need to build into your brain as you become an analyzer going, okay, check the packet length. Is it less than 60? Great, this trace was taken from this particular perspective, right? Um, on that note, I'm actually using a hard copy for my outline. You like that? Old school time. Um, one cool trick I want to show you, um, I call it bookmarking. And bookmarking is something, and we're actually going to, we're going to do a demo, lose a sale here. Why not? This is crazy. We're going to do it anyway. One thing we like to do, we're going to get on a, a network here. L.H. Miller, was that him? No. 
One thing we like to do is we're going to go to captures and we're going to get on our Wi-Fi and we're going to start capturing stuff. Oh, cool. We're capturing stuff. So let's say the problem statement is I try to go out to Google and it doesn't load. That's just the problem statement. One thing I will always like to do is I'll get everything kind of pre-staged and I'll get my browser open and I'm, I'm already tracing so I'm like wasting time but we're going to do it anyway. And then our mouse is going to die and it's going to look really awkward on camera. That's awesome. Touch screens. Cool. So we're going to ping 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. And then we're going to go over here wait until that's done. Four pings. Great. And then we're going to go to Google and I'm just going to go to Google again. That's a lot of fun. And then I'm going to ping 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 again. And four more pings. Cool. And I'm going to stop my trace. Now, in my trace, if I go for ICMP, there's my pings that I sent to Google, right? I now know that in between these pings, my problem occurred, or the issue I was trying to reproduce occurred. So one cool trick that I like to do is if I go into this, wow, now I have no mouse. This is super nice. You can right-click on these and set a time reference. Now, the cool thing about a time reference is time references will show up no matter what filter you are doing. So let's say I want to see just uh, tcp.port equals equals 443. As I look here in this trace, if I can find my bookmarks. Sorry, I'm going to cheat. They are right. I saw them and now they're gone. Actually, we're going to do a different way. We're going to cheat a different way because it's a better example. So, same setup. And we're going to ping. 8.8.8.8. And then I'm going to do a test net connection um, google.com dashboard 81. And then I'm making my attempt. And then I'm going to do ping 8.8.8.8. Stop my trace. Um, I'm going to tag those pings really quick, just so I have them. And then remember, I'm going to use that set time reference. And I'm going to set another time reference. Now, I'm not doing it in between the actual ones, but I'm just giving you the example. And then if I do tcp.port equals equals 81, those pings still show up. Even though that's not in my current filter, they show up. So. You tag your first one before you duplicate. You duplicate your problem. You tag your next one. And then as you filter, those will always show up and you'll find the problem you're looking for. So pretty handy. I use that quite a bit. Um, one danger of that is you'll notice, like, this is the display filter. And, and when you're filtering or when you're tracing, you can actually do a, uh, a, a filter on your trace when you take it. And just a word of warning on that, don't. Don't filter your trace before you. Don't filter your trace while you capture it. Filter the trace um, afterwards while you're doing the analyst, but capture every packet you get it. I always. I'm going to go back to a buffet analogy. Let me pick out my own food. Don't hand me a plate on what you want to give me. Right. Let, let me go through as an analyst and find those packets. Um, unless you're in a scenario where it's going to be so ginormous you can't. Really try to avoid cap or filtering from the get go. Um, and the reason is you run into dangers. We're Let's just say we're, for example, let's say we had a ping problem and we wanted to find it. And we're going to start another trace here. And for my test case, I'm going to ping, this isn't a real, oops, we're going to put those in there, in a real domain and this won't work. And they say, okay, I, I duplicate it for that. And you look in here, there's no ICMP. Well, of course there's no ICMP. We failed well before that even happened. We failed on name resolution. So this just illustrates the point. Capture everything, analyze second. I've been burnt way too many times personally of, of doing just that thing. I'll say, yeah, it's probably okay this time. 
filter the traces you capture, and then within a few hours, I'm like, no, go get me an unfiltered one. Now, one other thing, how many people work in environments where it's like, you can't just install whatever you want on our machines? You have any of those? And you say, I want to get a trace, and it's like, we'll put Wireshark on there. They're going to be like, no. Well, you could always do netsh trace start capture equals yes. That's built in. You can run that. You'll get an ETL file, which can be exported to a PCAP, but you can actually go ahead and run this on pretty much any modern Windows box um, and snag your trace that way. I have to do that quite often. The, the funny thing is I know about this, and I use this pretty often. I'll still tell people install Wireshark, not thinking. like, yeah, just install Wireshark and get a trace. Oh, wait, you could use NetSH. And eh, never mind, just go through it. Um, this isn't a Linux box, obviously, but for our Linux friends. There's your Linux version. That's what your command you'd use for that. Um, TCP dump is our friend. Let me snag those. OK, now, one other thing I like to bring up is I've been in places where I say, hey, you know what? I want to get a trace. And they're like, this is a secure facility. We can't give you a trace. I'm like, OK, can I have headers? And they'll be like, yeah, we can have headers. And then they'll try to take a capture, and um, they'll end up grabbing everything. I'm like, well, actually, you gave me everything, but I really wanted your headers. If you wanted to do that, you can actually go to your capture options here, go to your output, well, not output, on your input, sorry. Go here to your snap length, change that to 54, and you'll snag headers, and headers only. Um, really useful if, if some folks are saying, hey, we don't, want to see your, we don't want you to see our application traffic, just give me the headers. Some still information can be, get, got, can be analyzed from the headers. It's not as great as, as having everything, but it's a way that you can kind of appease the masses if they don't want to give you a trace. The other very common thing when taking a trace that I always hear is, well, the issue is intermittent. It happens sometimes, and, and I hear that so many times. Um, that's when you use what's called a ring trace, and so what you'll do is you'll have this new file creation automatically. You can, you can trigger a new file based on how long the trace was, how many, like multiples of hours. I normally just basically say, give me rings of like a gig each, and then use me a ring buffer of like five or so. So depending on how busy the network is, that'll, that'll obviously influence how big those files are. Um, but yeah, get this trace going and say, hey, the moment you see the problem, you let me know, and then you can remote in and stop the trace, or you can have an admin remote and stop the trace. Having that ring buffer of five files building a gig file each time, usually enough time to get in there and stop it. So very useful for intermittent issues, times you don't see, you know, times when things aren't happening all the time, you can't trigger it, it's kind of a, there's an outside condition causing it, all that good stuff like that. Um, cool. On that note, I'm gonna dive in some traces and just kind of show you some cool stuff that we find on here. Okay, I'm not really doing this, I promise. Cool. So what we're going to do is, we talked about the three-way handshake a little bit before. Um, let's open up our, let's do an unanswered sin. So, Let's just snag, oh, actually, did I keep that trace? Was this the one I just did? I think it was. Okay, so this is a, so I'm looking for the SIN bits over so the TCP three-way handshake, a SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK. One thing you can do if you're wanting to look for your unanswered ones, you can actually go here to your statistics and then go to your conversations and then limit that to our display filter and any time when you've got host A and host B, if one of these is, has like three, four, or five packets and the other one is zero, those are unanswered SINs. So if you're trying to troubleshoot something where, let's say you've got an application where you don't know the port it's gonna be listening on or it's a dynamic and you're like, oh, I just need to see all the times that a SIN failed, do that display filter to see all those SINs, tcp.flags.sin equals equals one, equals equals one, and then head out to where there's zero responses here. Um, quick way you can just find those that, um, those sins that go unanswered. Um, there, there, there's, always, there's always tips and tricks and things that speed that up, but honestly, using these built-in statistics conversations, your endpoints, your IO graphs, these are the things that help you focus in on what you're gonna be looking for specifically. Um, because it's really easy in a PCAP, and I do it all the time, is I'll pigeonhole myself down a path and I'll start looking just like, oh, there's some errors, I'm just gonna sprint off in that direction. Um, I do that myself often, but using these built-in, the conversations, the endpoints, all that is, is kind of a good way to keep that holistic view of what you're looking at. Um, one thing I want to check, show you is, 
We're going to open up this T-tail example right here. We're going to throw that trace away. And then I'm going to filter to this, because I've already made this trace beforehand. It's like those cooking shows where they have all the ingredients lined up in little bowls. These are my little bowls of ingredients here. So what this is, is this is a machine reaching out via TLS, HTTPS, and there's that three-way handshake we know and love, since in ACAC, we love it so much. Um, as we go down, it has some communication. This is all encrypted, so I can't see what it is. Um, scrolling around, scrolling around. All of a sudden, I get a reset. Now, everyone's going to play the game of, well, who sent the reset? Why did I get reset? Now, at face value, you're going to say, well, obviously, this 172.217.7.110 sent me a reset. It's in the packet list. I can see that. Not entirely the case. I'm going to show you the beauty that is the IP header down here. This is the IP header. And you've got this time to live of 128. Now, this is my own machine, this 192.168.189. The server that I've been talking to has a time to live of 59. Now, these time to lives in routing world, they start at some number, depending on the manufacturer. It'll be either be 128 or 64, or some older stuff's 255. And as it goes through each router, it decrements that time to live by one. Reason being, if you didn't do that, there'd be packets still circling the globe today. You basically have to say, if you can't find your way, someone needs to throw them away. So you set this time to live and say, if after 64 hops you don't find it, I am so sorry for your loss, you're getting discarded. Now. How is that useful for us? Well, I know that this guy that I've been talking to that's been working fine is a time to live 59. I just got a reset from that guy that has a time to live of 64. Why do I have a time to live? Why did my time to live suddenly change? Answer that question, that far side did not send that reset. That far side was sent by my router on my local broadcast domain because it's 64, it hasn't been decremented. So a firewall in the middle reset that connection. The reason I know it did that is because I actually did that on my firewall to make this example. However, if you look at that, and, and you'll run into this a bunch when you're doing, anal doing, um, doing analysis, you'll see resets. The first thing you'll always want to check is check that conversation you've been having this whole time and see if that time to live has changed. If that time to live has suddenly changed, good chance there's something in the middle. It might not be a firewall, it might be something else. Something in the middle has interjected itself, and then count the hops away of how far it is to start, looking, to start furthering your investigation that way. In the world of PCAPs, not every time will there be like a smoking gun in your trace. What it will do is it'll say, hey, here's our next place we're going to look at. Um, I know I got a reset on my local network. I now know I need to investigate my gateway because he's in my broadcast domain. That reset had a time to live at 64, so it hadn't been decremented. That's my area that I need to focus my investigation. So kind of cool. That's probably the, honestly, if I just say like the best trick that, not best trick, but the best thing to learn out of this is if you're trying to find connection breakdowns, look at your time to live. Moving on, um, I'm going to show you, I took a bunch of traces of like Samba, Samba, like, and I was doing kind of older school Samba, I wasn't doing any fancy Samba 3 stuff. Um, I'm going to look at this Samba client 200 millisecond latency. Um, and what I did on this trace is I have a Samba server that was just running on an Ubuntu box. And then I use traffic control on Linux. Uh, traffic control is a cool utility. You can simulate all sorts of network problems. You can throw 200 milliseconds of latency on every socket. You can corrupt or garble 5% of your packets. You can tell it to retransmit 10% of your packets. Really useful for building traces for examples, but also useful if you want to say, hey, what would the real world example be if I had a big long WAN link across the country with an 80 millisecond delay? You can introduce those um, delays in, in, in your trace. So this is a Samba, this is a transfer of Samba, and I'm going to practice what I pe preach and look at the conversations on this trace. And you can see a bunch of conversations, a bunch of stuff was going on in that network. If we actually just flip around those bytes, one of those conversations is a lot bigger than the other ones, that's 88 megs, and um, we'll go to TCP. So 88 megs, TCP, port 445, that's a Windows file copy, right? One thing that you can do right here, right click on that, prepare a filter, selected, A to B, close that. And that's filtering to just that connection without having to type a single query command. So super handy, super cool to do. Now, one thing I want to show you in statistics, if we go to our service response time and go to SMB2, and it's going to load that up, this is every call that was made. And you can do display filters here, so you can actually copy pasta this one right here, 
down to the display filter if you wanted, but since the um, trace really only had one big Samic connection and this is it, you can see the minimum service response time, the max service response time, and your average response time for each one of these verbs. So I did 77 verbs, and my minimum was 0.2 because remember I said that 200 millisecond delay, and my max was, uh, was 8.4 with an average of five. The sum of all of those verbs were 427 seconds. So what does this tell us? Is this a smoking gun in this trace? No, it's not. But what you can now do with this information is say, com start comparing these numbers. Now, since mine's an artificial trace, and I added that artificial, let's say we're doing a SAMA transfer in that file, in that um, backend storage is on, a, is on a LUN on our SAN somewhere, and that LUN's having issues, but only on reads. You could actually notice that these reads are much higher or much lower than the writes. So you can use this from, by the nature of investigating the protocol, you can actually use this information to say, hey, we're reading great. Read performance, fantastic. Write performance, not so much. And so it will kind of guide you into the next thing that you wanna, that you wanna take a look at. Um, one other cool thing I wanna show about performance, um, and we're gonna use the same trace, we're gonna go to packet 693, for example, right here. Um, I, I started this trace kind of in the middle so you don't see the actual uh, TCP three-way handshake, the, the socket had already been established. But I want to point out this packet right here. This is me, 192.168.1.95, talking to 192.168.1.99, and I'm doing a SMB verb of tree connect request, and that's the path that I'm trying to do. Notice this next packet right here doesn't have any application data in it. You see how it's just layer four, there's just TCP. And then right next is the tree connect response, which is the actual response to that um, tree connect I did. Why is there a TCP right there in the middle? Answer to that is the application layer hadn't responded yet. I had done a request to do that tree connect and say, hey, I wanna to talk to this IP and I'm looking for the IPC dollar sign share. TCP, after waiting, and remember, we're going back to that delta that I always leave up, TCP waited, now, TCP waited 200 milliseconds before it sent that response. Now, since I had that artificial on there, that number's gonna be a little skewed, but if an application doesn't respond in a timely manner, the TCP stack's gonna act that packet and say, hey, you know what? I got your request, don't send it again. I'm working on it, just hang out for a bit. And you'll see that all the time. Now, how is that useful when you're analyzing traces? If you see a bunch of that, if you see the packet, the request, the application layer requests go out, that tree connect or whatever an HTTP get, and you see TCP act it really quick, and then wait, and then wait, and then the application acts it, and that pattern goes through all that, or it keeps following that pattern, you can say, well, my network's really not having problem delaying, delivering those packets. I'm getting a TCP act lickety split, but the application layer is not responding to me in a, in a timely manner. So from there, you can now focus your investigation to whatever daemon's listening on that backend, whether it be Apache, Nginx, whatever, because, and they'll say, well, it's a network problem, it's slow. Slow equals network problem always because that's what we've trained ourselves to do. However, by using this trace, you can actually say, nope, I made it lickety split, and for whatever reason, your application didn't respond in a timely manner, now we need to go look at that application. So, super cool, check for that when you're looking at traces, and you'll see this one has a ton of those examples. There's a create request, there's the TCP act, there's another one, there's a TCP act, so yeah, just keep your eye out for that, and as you kind of get more comfortable and as you keep doing these, you're gonna start learning these patterns. You're gonna start learning, hey, I'm getting TCP acts, but not application layer acts. Let's go look at the application layer. Um, another cool thing, we're gonna jump to a different trace again. Again, this is the cafeteria. I'm literally just like throwing food out on the thing and just take what you like and what you don't like, say no thanks. Um, we're gonna go to this 5% corrupt, and as you can see, I cannot spell the word corrupt. That's corrupt, whatever that was. And if that wants, oh, let's get rid of our filters here. That's better. So I've got another trace, and what I did is I told um, I told TC on um, on Linux, go ahead and corrupt corrupt five percent of the trap packets just for funsies, just corrupt them. And then I said, and by the way, do a random smattering of retrans just as much as you want, and ten percent, which is a lot. Let's say you've just got some slowness, you don't like how it's running, one great thing you can do is go here to your statistics, or sorry, analyze, and then go to your doo -doo -doo, expert information. And again, like before, I can still limit it to my display filter, so just look at we, what we wanna see. And there's an error, and I've got, oh, malformed packet. There's only one of them, that's interesting. So, let's kick off that display filter. 
and look at all of our others. Wow, we've got 11,538 retrans. Why did I not see it the first time? Because I filtered to only to SMB2. And so I was relying on Wireshark's dissector that looks at those packets and makes sure there's an application layer header on there that says this is SMB2, and that's how it was classifying it. Since I got rid of that and I undid that display filter, now I'm seeing anything that is a suspected retrans, and I've got 11,538 of those retransmits. Cool thing you can do, click that drop down right there, and as you click through, it'll actually take you in the trace where they are. Now you'll notice in the background it's saying it's not displayed. That's because I've still got this filter on there. Take that off. Go back to here. Try to find your retrans. There they are. And as you click through, it'll actually take you in the trace in the background. You can see it's moving around there to all those retrans. Now, granted, you're going to get retrans, you're going to get dupacks. That's TCP doing its job. It's going to do that. That's just how it works. Don't go crazy going, oh my goodness, I'm having 100 retransmits in 30,000 packets. Guess what? Who cares? That's TCP. Let us do a thing. But if you're seeing in a trace that's only a few seconds long, you've got 12,000 retrans, you probably got something you need to look at there, right? Now, moving right along to our um, the world of Samba. I'm staying in Samba just because it's kind of easy to illustrate. Um, I'm going to go to Samba Wireless. And all this was, this was me just copying a file across my network over wireless. Um, really not super exciting. It is kind of a big file because obviously I captured everything because filter second, not first. That's my golden rule. And so now we just get to awkwardly look while my laptop reads through these packets. So how we all doing? Good, great. <laughs> Cool, here we go. Now, one thing I want to show you is I'm just going to filter this trace in the display filter. I'm just going to filter to port 445 just to save us a little bit of time as I go into my next area that I'm going to show you so we don't have to do this more than once. Wireshark has a built-in IO graph that will actually calculate your, your input-output speed based on the packets coming through it. Um, this is super handy, especially when you have users telling you, hey, you know, file copies are slow, they're, they're not going to expect, I'm getting one megabit, or I'm, they give you some arbitrary number. You can actually capture that packet, or capture that trace as they do it, and see what the actual, um, what the actual speed looks like. That's here under your statistics, under your IO graphs. And again, you can filter this down to, I'm going to go to all packets, oh, not all packets, I'm going to go to port 445. And we're going to recalculate that. And while we do that, I'm going to bring up the screenshot of Windows, what it showed. So we have that up there. Does that work? Yeah, you can see that. Cool. As we load. Um, you can see kind of the hills and valleys here. It, this Obviously, Windows is smoothing that out, and it's not giving the exact number at each step, but it kind of gives you the average. And if we look at that graph, you actually see it looks pretty similar as far as... There's obviously a lot more um, detail here in the in the Wireshark version of it. But you can see that pattern follows a pretty similar drop as that. So you can actually extract this performance out um, from, the, from the raw trace itself. Um, on that note, um, a lot of times when you're, taking, when you're talking about performance tracing, getting one side of a conversation isn't super helpful because you're, you're tracing from the works from the, um, the viewpoint of this workstation, you're sending out across the wire and you're just waiting whatever comes back to you, right? So what we'll do a lot of times, we'll call it, do what's called simultaneous traces, where I'll trace here and I'll trace on the server at the same time and, and we'll compare them and see what's going on. Well, one thing you need to do when you do that is line your packets up in your list because you'll have a bunch of packets here from this workstation, which is obviously being exposed to different networks that it's seeing. You got your server network that's being exposed to different networks and different packets and all that good stuff. So you need a good way to line those up. So I'm going to show you the niftiest trick ever to line those up. We are going to go back to our um, 200 millisecond latency. There's the client side. And 
we're gonna go open wire shark again. And we're gonna open the server side. Uh, there's the server side. And thanks to the magic of widescreens, we're gonna go like that. And it's a little smashed, and I'm sorry, it doesn't look great, but that's kind of the best we can do. So we're gonna go like this, tcp.port equals equals 445. Okay, so we just filtered it basically to Samba on both sides. If you go to one of these packets and just pick a packet that you like, it doesn't matter which one, let's just do this tree connect. Um, you go to your IP header, and each one has this identification on it. You can right click on that, prepare a filter, selected, hit enter on that. There's that particular IP ID, copy that, go to our other trace, go like that. There it is, right click on there, and do mark packet, do mark packet. You could do a time reference if you wanted it to show up all the time. And then when we go back to our default filter, In those two traces, you see that one and that one, that's where those two packets line up in the trace. So as you go through, you're now lined up and you can keep doing that. You can keep doing that procedure over and over again. It's just depending on your protocols, how chatty they are, how many times they perform the same functions. Sometimes I'll mark each one, each time I do like a tree connect or a, an open file or whatever, do that IP, line them up, mark all those. So as I'm analyzing on both sides of the trace, I can kind of keep those lined up in my head. Um, so yeah, so that's how you, the best part, that's the best way to kind of line up your simultaneous trace. And again, it's going to be a matter of looking at who's having the delays. Why are we seeing deltas? Why are those increasing on one side or the other? Um, sometimes you'll get a packet delivered really speedy, that box will sit and chew on it for a while and then send it slow back um, after a little bit, or it'll send a response really speedy and the, and the client doesn't see it for a while. It's all about narrowing down your next step of troubleshooting. Like I said, you're not gonna see a smoking gun every time, but you will get it narrowed down a bit. Um, I wanted to jump into file extraction because that's a cool thing that folks like to do. Um, I'm gonna use that CTF from, um, from St. Con again. So inside this uh, trace, there's things that happen. I know what's in this trace because I've got, obviously gone through the CTF, but I know files were transferred. I know that actually occurred. So I'm gonna go here to file and export objects, and then based on protocol, you can actually export anything that was transferred over those protocols during the trace. So just for funsies, let's click on Samba. And then I just go change the size. And during that time, someone transferred this MP4 file on our, on our network. Now, can I save that? You betcha I can and save that, and just throw that to documents, save that. And there's the file I just ripped out of the PCAP. That works for SMB, you can do it over HTTP, super cool, super handy. One alternate way I wanna show you to do that same thing, which I think is um, a little bit easier, is using a cool tool called Network Miner. Fire up Network Miner. We're gonna open that same PCAP. No, we're not gonna update in the middle of a presentation. That would be bad. Um, open up this. It's gonna go through and parse it. Network Miner does some co other cool parsing stuff for you. Um, it'll have all your hosts and you can filter down on those. Um, it's going to fire that up. Cool. And then I can click on the images tab and here's every picture that was transferred during that session in nice, easy thumbnails. Now let's say someone has a silly uh, web service and they're just dumping credentials on clear text. Well, we get those too. Super cool tool. Um, here's everyone's DNS queries, where they're all going, who is making them, all that fun stuff. Network Miner is a super cool tool you can use, especially if you are um, just have a network tap somewhere and you just kind of keep an eye on what's going on. Let's say you're worried someone's exfiltrating data, throw a network tap on, have Network Miner on there, have a quick look of see what's going through. Super handy for uh, from a blue team perspective. Um, those are kind of the main tips and tricks I wanted to show you. I, and a lot of this is like question and answer and stuff. So what question does anyone have in the whole world of PCAPs for me, if any? And I will do my best to make something up for you.
Everyone's like, yeah, please go ahead. I, I heard something with SSI, I didn't hear the rest, sorry. Okay, so you're gonna run into some issues, especially anytime you're doing security stuff on SSO, because it's gonna be encrypted. You're, you're gonna run into that. So you're gonna have to do export, exportation of your keys to be able to have a look into that. But one cool thing that I'm glad you brought up is, in the world, especially if you're on a Linux box, in the world of Linux, a lot of time when application, one application is talking to another on the same host, that's talking via sockets just internally to itself. In that TCP dump command that I mentioned, if you on your interface do LO, your loopback interface, you can actually see applications talking to itself on the same box, just different, um, just different daemons talking to each other. So on a state where you're trying to like troubleshoot an SSO problem and it's this box is talking to itself, super easy ways to do it and you don't have to worry about certificates because you're already on the box. So kind of a cool way to do that. Cool, if there's no any other questions, that'll do it for me, thanks so much.